right now we are already at more than 300 million US dollar locked up in, um, in, in DeFi. And this is actually a lot. If you think about that, it started from zero and with exponential growth, we will hit a billion dollar worth of um, money stored in DeFi very soon than 10 million, billion, eventually maybe even 100 billion or more. And that will probably, yeah, be one of the next drivers in the next bull run, um, DeFi. It's gonna be Bitcoin, it's maybe gonna be the financial crisis and probably also DeFi. More and more people are buying and holding Bitcoin. 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 Let's take a look at Bitcoin. Some call this digital gold. Everybody should probably have 1% of their assets in Bitcoin. First off, Sandy, which is really interesting is you kicked off an engineering software mm. development and you did a little bit of legal law mm. studies. Yeah. What really made you passionate about this space and think DeFi is for me? <laughs> yeah, I think like funny part, like when we started back in a few years ago, uh, there wasn't like DeFi as, as a kind of like a, as a buzzword or as a space. We just were basically uh, using smart contracts to develop different kinds of financial products and, and protocols. And our previous product, uh, which was EatLend, was basically the first lending protocol in Ethereum. And we just basically, we were passionate about finance uh, and uh, basically wanted to create something uh, very interesting, like uh, trustless, transparent way to uh, let other people to interact. And that's how kind of got us into the space. And uh, uh, by the time the space developed a bit, we got stable coins, liquidity pools, and uh, and then basically, uh, voila, you had DeFi. <laughs> yeah. You were a real visionary because lending, you were ahead of the curve. Yeah. Now in 2020, lending is one of the biggest topics yeah. across the crypto space. Why did you think lending had so much potential back in those days? What was your vision at the time? The interesting part is like now, like the lending space, as you said, is very interesting. There's like very uh, interesting lending protocols. And, and like, I really admire where we are at this point uh, the, as a whole, like a community in DeFi. Uh, especially in, uh, now in Ethereum, there's the most liquidity at the moment. Uh, what's interesting, like back in the days, uh, we started uh, kind of like before the stable coins were, and back then lending was very difficult because uh, you weren't uh, borrowing like a stable asset. So you had to do different kinds of hedging and that wasn't very liquid. And once the stable coins came out and, and basically, uh, especially like DAI and now USDT into the uh, ERC20 uh, format and, and USDC as well from, from Coinbase, what it allowed to basically do is that DeFi now grow where it is, because uh, instead of holding US dollars in your account or an other fiat currency, you get like uh, much better yields from the DeFi space. And that's what attracts people uh, in, in the first place, the yields. And of course, the technology serves uh, to make like uh, trustless transactions is even more fascinating. The whole story of DeFi, right, and the emergence of this completely permissionless ecosystem of rapid innovation. I mean, so first of all, it's just amazing that that our, our fundamental idea of that we would build DAI, we would build this stable, uh, you know, bottom layer infrastructure, and then we would promote for everyone else to build as many cool new innovations on top of it. And that paid off, right? And we've seen all these DeFi projects. Um, but also that some of the coolest of these DeFi projects are coming from, you know, the places where you wouldn't necessarily expect it. Um, and for instance, one project I really love to highlight is InstaDAP which is this, uh, it's the fourth most um, popular DeFi project in the world based on, on uh, value locked on their platform. And it was created by two teenagers with, you know, zero connections, zero capital whatsoever, uh, who built this platform from the ground up without even being in touch with us, right? So they just released it one day. Um, and what they also did is they really unlocked this, one of the inherent, like one of the fundamental powers of, of DeFi which is uh, this concept that's often summarized as uh, money Legos. 
So this idea that DeFi and the inherent um, you know, interoperability of blockchain and the permissionlessness of decentralized networks allows you to take existing building blocks out there. So things like Maker, you know, Compound, which is another popular DeFi project, right? And, and stick them together and create completely new services by combining other projects together. And that's what, what um, Instadab invented. So that's what these, these um, uh, innovators out of India they, they were the first ones to really to do that at, and, and uh, do it successfully with like a great use of front end. And uh, it paid off, you know, so they, they're the fourth most popular project. They were funded uh, with, with several million dollars from the top investors in the space. And I think that's just the beginning of like a new wave of innovation that can emerge from anywhere, right? Because all you need is the, the idea and the skills to, to code it and you can do it. You don't need permission, you don't need you know, you don't even really need to start capital. You just need the passion to actually go and build it. As with uh, many previous cycles of uh, hype in our industry, um, at the same time that you have a lot of hype that really has no justification and that hype attracts a lot of scams, a lot of poorly thought projects, a lot of immature code creating uh, opportunity for losses and risk. Um, at the same time, there is a nugget of, of truth and innovation and excitement underneath all that, and that uh, this is exploring new grounds in technology. So um, it's, it's a double-edged sword. Um, one of the things about Ethereum that interests me is that uh, the smart contracts infrastructure in Ethereum, the virtual machine that allows um, complex smart contracts to be built, um, allows us to explore uh, areas that cannot be implemented and should not be implemented with Bitcoin script because in order to gain flexibility, we lose a bit in terms of robustness and security, but that's fine. That's just a simple point, uh, a different point on the trade-off. Um, so if you think about a trade-off between robustness and flexibility, uh, Bitcoin has uh, chosen a point much, much more on the robustness side, which makes it less flexible, much more simple. And Ethereum has chosen an opposite point that's more flexible, but as a result, less robust. And uh, I think it's important to explore both ends of that spectrum. What's interesting about DeFi is um, one aspect in particular is this concept of composability, uh, or as uh, people in Ethereum call it, uh, money Lego. Uh, the idea being that you have these components that can be built uh, to express various financial instruments or financial structures um, from lending contracts to crowdfunding systems to stable coins that are decentralized, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can build a project that combines five or six of these components to build something more complex. So you can use a bit of uh, decentralized exchange infrastructure plus a stable coin plus an identity um, token plus a non-fungible token to build a new application uh, without having to re-implement these things. And what that allows us to do is explore um, all of these different areas as well as gradually build maturity into these contracts through repeated use with the risks that come with that. Um, and so I find it very interesting and very exciting. Uh, there's a very big difference between um, a geek finding the technology interesting and that being a smart uh, investment. And I want to make that clear. I'm not advocating for this as a smart investment. In fact, I think that space is, is very risky because um, it has to be in order to explore these new areas. Um, but from a technology perspective, in terms of the innovation that's happening, uh, that generates a lot of very exciting innovations. And uh, I think it's worth paying attention to those, uh, even if you're not investing in them. So over the history of finance, as you know, it's always been extremely exclusive, where it's very privileged people behind closed doors that will sign contracts and make you know a shitload of money before an IPO, et cetera, et cetera. But this time, and this is to me the most exciting part about decentralized finance, is that we, the normal people, the average Joes, 
can get access to a market even before the institutions and all these privileged people. So uh, I don't know if that message resonates with you, but to me, it means the world. Oh, absolutely. I, that was the problem that I think we saw in the crypto space back in 2017 is that, uh, you know, there, there still was a sense of exclusivity. And that's what I think what DeFi is fixing. Uh, to build on your point, Alex, th this is my kind of vision, you know, to put it in a kind of a macro perspective. You know, I, I think in the future, what we're going to see is more and more of a push for like digital wallets, people becoming their own banks, not having to trust, you know, uh, too much in regards to like centralized institutions. And I think that, you know, whether or not there's a mixture, I think there's going to be a mixture of the two. We're going to live in a world where above all, the key priority is, is that someone in Kenya right now, someone in Kenya with a simple mobile device in their hands can get the exact same opportunities that you or I can, whether you're in the UK, I'm in the US, you know, and that person's in Kenya. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. So long as you have that base technological device, you have access to every single opportunity that everyone else has. I mean, this is the next internet in this case. So the kind of uh, wealth transfer that this would bring for everyday people, the sheer improvement to life and quality of life for everyday people who are working and, you know, just to get by and go through ends meet. I mean, this is going to be revolutionary if we can do this right. And if we can collaborate as a space together to make it happen, it's it's not a matter of, you know, uh, what I hate in crypto is I see a lot of inner competition and stuff. Crypto is open. It, most of it is open source code. And it's a matter of building systems that collaborate and work with one another as seamlessly as possible. So we can go from the minute market share we have right now to something that dominates the traditional financial sector. That's our real enemy. You know, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, these people who, again, are either just starting to look at crypto or still bashing it. They have every incentive to do so on a, on a truly like macro level. So what we need to see now is a lot more collaboration, building those tools and making sure we do everything in our power, whether it's on a regulatory framework or in a technological framework to make sure that people get access to those opportunities equally, no matter where they're, where they're born or where they come from, it should be open to everyone. It's kind of like the typical cycle of overhype. Are we a little bit overdoing it or is it really what we believe it will be? What is your take as of today, the pros and cons? Uh, but look, I, I don't think it's overhyped. Why? Because most people don't have any DeFi. They, they, they don't have any funds in DeFi. Uh. <laughs> so overhype would be if people start throwing money at DeFi, expecting some kind of return or some kind of you know speculative gain, quick money. Yeah. DeFi is not really like that. It doesn't work like that. People who use DeFi, they actually need the product. They, that's, that, that's the big difference between ICOs and ICO hype and DeFi hype. Because DeFi hype is about the fact that people want to, for example, get some um, uh, fiat for their crypto without selling it. Yeah. Because when you sell uh, crypto to fiat, you might have huge gains and your government will tax you. Instead, you lock it into uh, DeFi, you get uh, stablecoin, you basically create the CDP alone and you get stablecoin. And then you can convert that stablecoin to dollars. And because there is no difference in price between the stablecoin and the dollar, you have no gain. You just have a loan. And you can then spend your uh, fiat for em emergency expenses or maybe want to do something with fiat. Basically, if you need fiat, but you don't want to sell your crypto, DeFi is your friend. That is how you can get uh, uh, fiat for your crypto. Then you also have derivatives, you have these decentralized exchanges, you have Uniswap. There are so many protocols building. And there is no way for you to really speculate. I mean, yes, some protocols have tokens, but most of the hype we're seeing in DeFi, and when you see the uh, the amount of assets, amount of uh, Ether that is being locked into DeFi go up, it's not because people are speculating. Because, look, you cannot spec you, you can just use DeFi. And when yeah. you use DeFi, you lock in funds and the... the, the passive uh, income, right? Or passive income is, is a good exa example yeah. with Compound, for example, yes. And um, therefore, I don't see any, you know, uh, dumb money, so to speak. Money who doesn't know what DeFi is, they just throw money at it because it's a hype. Because you cannot do it. You can just use the product. So what we're seeing is actual adoption. Adoption, yeah. This, if you go to DeFiPulse.com, I think, you see how much money is being locked into DeFi and how it's growing exponentially, basically. And that's adoption because that's the only way it can, it can grow, that people actually use DeFi. So I, I don't think it's, it's a hype. I think it's very important. In the future, you, in order to take a mortgage, you will go to your web browser, type in like, you know, uh, just like you type in HTTP to get information, to, to go to a website, there will be like, you know, lending and then, uh, you know, uh, slash, slash, and then you get your lending protocol. You will get mortgage from the internet 
from internet lending protocols. And Compound is the, the early one. There will be others. The same with, with interest. When you want to get some cash, cash flow on your money, you also just lock it into DeFi. I think it will be very easy available through your browser. All the browsers will support it in the future. You don't need to have MetaMask. Uh, but uh, right now you do need, but in the future, I think all of the big browsers will be integrating with blockchain DeFi because otherwise they will not be competitive. So it's, it's a big thing. I think DeFi is, uh, is the biggest thing that has happened to crypto since, uh, maybe since Bitcoin, to be honest. Maybe since Bitcoin, because that is how Ethereum really showed yeah, that how was valuable. The original, yeah, the whole decentralized finance, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean and the because, white paper and because from the beginning, Ethereum was yeah. just for ICOs and people thought, hey, what is this? <laughs> is it only for ICOs? That's it. And uh, Ethereum didn't show itself until DeFi. So that's why I think that DeFi is this event. The, the growth of DeFi is maybe the, the second biggest event after, after Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is the first creation of Bitcoin and then growth of DeFi is the second big event. That's really interesting. So DeFi is an asset class and you have sub-asset classes. Is the lending... No, I, I wouldn't say that DeFi is an asset class per se. DeFi is uh, just decentralized applications that can be used for finance. For finance. Yeah. Some of them have assets, like synthetics, they, there's an asset, there's a token, but many of them don't. So it's... Uh, it's well, just it's, a technology it's, without it's a token, It's just a technology right? without yeah. a token. That's, yeah. that's why I'm telling you that we don't really see a hype that mm. is unfounded because there's no way for you to really speculate in many of these things. But you can use them and then that... Uh, that uh, chart that shows how much money is being locked in, then it will go up. Yeah. It's already 3 million Ethereum right now it's locked in? I don't know how many Ethereum, but it's like $300 million. Yeah, in, $300 million, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's so a that's a real <laughs> use case, right? And, and it went from zero in just one year ago. So it's one, two years ago, it was zero. Now it's 300 million. So it's exponential growth. In terms of the asset class and the sub-asset classes, like we have lending, we have passive income, like what are some of the projects that you see are the most beneficial at the moment in terms of being in that DeFi asset class? Augur is definitely Augur. one of the, the yeah. sleeping giants that, that still hasn't reached its full potential. But I mean, I think it really shows, like it, it ha there's a lot of aspects of Augur that just have that real world benefit, right? And real potential because um, I mean, having these, these uh, decentralized and fundamentally, you know, neutral and unbiased uh, prediction markets it just it, it it's just a, a benefit for the whole world right because it's really powerful to have this kind of system that just works right and it's decentralized can't be shut down um and it's available to everyone right and and one thing is that it allows people to you know to you know essentially gamble on on predictions and all you know kind of like the consumer side of it but it also just means that there is this source of information that's created by the blockchain which i think is is just very unique Decentralized stable coins are one way of increasing adoption um, because it simplifies um, the understanding of cryptocurrency. Uh, cryptocurrency can be extremely volatile. Um, uh, and although the volatility uh, from the perspective of an Iranian or Venezuelan or an Argentinian looks pretty good because it's upwards volatility compared to their own currency, um, it's, it's very difficult when um, you can't use the cryptocurrency as a unit of account because its value changes um, uh, against the fiat currency that you're familiar with. So I see it uh, primarily as a user interface capability. It allows uh, cryptocurrencies to be easier to use for specific applications involving use as a medium of exchange and units of account for day-to-day uh, transactions. So if you want to see adoption in that area, it's easier to adopt that with a stable coin. Um, but if you want to do it as a form of savings or uh, as a safe haven to escape uh, hyperinflation, then uh, I think Bitcoin serves that role better. Uh, but it's not either or. Uh, you can combine mm -hmm. the two and get essentially a basket of capabilities that solves a, a variety of problems. And I, I, I think it's important uh, when we're looking at the cryptocurrency ecosystem, uh, not to try to specify which solutions the market should adopt from an ideological perspective and accept the fact that we can't know what different people need in other places who live 
in a very different way than we do and allow or expect or accept that they will make their own choices, that the market will decide what is useful in Iran and, you know, non-Iranian white boy over here doesn't know a fucking thing about what your average Iranian needs in Tehran. Uh, it's, it's important to keep perspective. Um, so uh, from that perspective, I think that uh, there are a variety of things uh, that serve different needs in our ecosystem and the market uh, will pick and choose the solutions that are most appropriate at this time for each geography and each uh, location or culture or country or economic system. DeFi has some programs that go all the way up to 15%. Now, yes. is this realistic or is there any risk behind it? Do you have any advice for those platforms offering crazy like interest? Exactly. Like the thing, like what I love about to talk most is, is the risk because like these different uh, DeFi protocols and, and especially when you go multiple layers in the compatibility, uh, you have like uh, kind of like piled up risk. And what is interesting, like uh, in one way, because the, the network effect in, in decentralized finance is, is pretty much the liquidity. Mm -hmm. And to get liquidity, you need to hack that liquidity. So we, I, I call it basically yield hacking. So when, when different pro protocols or, or um, different kinds of um, algorithms are doing this yield hacking, uh, they're either taking more risk or are, are using techniques that take, for example, market risk and, and basically providing more yield. I definitely think like the, the very base layer protocols in terms of lending, uh, the yields might go down at some point unless you introduce a bit of uh, riskier assets. And by riskier, you don't need to go all the way down to the risk rabbit hole, but basically slightly more risk. And I, I just think like yield hacking is part of the space and, 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 and we will see like a lot of interesting yield opportunities. But also I think the problematic part in DeFi now is that uh, we don't disclose disclose the risk that we have very well for the end user. And I think that's problematic now. That's really interesting. So you believe like the 15 or 12% is kind of like <clears throat> yield hacking, but it will definitely scale back a little yeah, bit as we move forward. Definitely. Because there will be more competition on the same particular level. For example, uh, we compete with different lending protocols and kind of not just compete, but we complement each other. So we might have a uh, protocol on top of us that actually uses our protocol and, and basically uh, other lending protocols, which is pretty cool uh, in terms of compatibility, and, and the capital allocation will move pretty quickly. So let's say if we have even 2% better yields than other lending protocols, uh, the capital will move quickly algorithmically in the future to our protocol. And if uh, some other protocol will have the same, it moves there. So we, we definitely are not there yet in terms of algorithmic uh, uh, capital allocation, but we are definitely going towards that uh, uh, kind of like a path. There's a whole DeFi ecosystem. There's so many startups, there's so many entrepreneurs, there's so many innovators all around the world that's building so many like just awesome applications, right? Um, but if you kind of like zoom out and look at it from a, from a broader perspective, um, it's still such a tiny, tiny ecosystem, right? I mean, it's a tiny market, right? Like even now with like DAI, um, the, the transition to multilateral DAI essentially being uh, you know, fully successful and We've almost reached the mark where there's a there's a hundred million um, hundred million multilateral DAI in circulation. Um, I mean that is actually nothing if you compare that to let's say a commercial bank, right? It's it's not really the basis for any sort of like real financial system, right? Or you can't you can't bank the unbank with a hundred million dollars, right? You need a lot more. You need billions. What we instead need to to create a, a system that is scalable, but also you know, secure and, and resilient and can last into the future, we need diversification of the assets in the system, right? So we need to go beyond just Ethereum. We need to go beyond just crypto even, right? We need to go into real world assets. And real world assets, um, I mean, that is the frontier of DeFi and of, of really blockchain in general. That is, yeah, I mean, it's gonna be the biggest challenge yet, right? Because that's when we have to take all of our ideals, right? All of like our, you know, our fundamental goals such as, you know, unbiased, unstoppable, stable coin for everyone, right? And we have to actually go out and we have to explain to the regulators why the benefits of decentralization outweigh the, you know, what they perceive as issues such as it's, it's suddenly they can't control it all the way they normally do with the banks, right? Um, yet we still want them to support us, right? Because they need to, they need to help with the, the, 
like the the assets and the like the, the liquidity that can allow something like Dai to scale to many billions, right? We need you know we need real estate, we need trade finance, we need commodities, we need um, you know um, stocks and and just all these regular markets. And if we can get those tokenized, right? So we can do things like security tokens or, or, or asset-backed tokens. Then it can also start powering a many, you know, all of the financial innovation in the DeFi ecosystem, right? There'll be, they'll have both a, a very stable DAI that's backed by diversified assets, but they'll also have the ability to do things like, um, you know, automated market making for, um, I don't know, like commodity futures or something, right? Or, you know, insurance on, um, you know, the custody of gold or something like that, right? And it's also only become apparent to us just how much we have to continue with this approach, right? And how the entire industry and the ecosystem has to come together and really, you know, present this unified front of blockchain is a good thing, right? It's going to actually benefit everyone. It's going to benefit the regular people. It's going to benefit the unbanked, the disenfranchised. It even has benefits for the regulators because for many regulators, their main concern is actually the exact same concern as those of us who are in crypto, right? Which is the you know the threat of uh, shady centralized actors right yeah. that, that sit behind the scenes and suddenly uh, turns out you couldn't trust them as much as you thought right? absolutely yeah like the fact that a, like and, and also something like the radical transparency of blockchain it's actually sometimes when when i go and i like, explain that to, to let's say um like um like financial or like securities regulators right and they they understand that this means i can do a real-time audit at all times, right? That's like, that's exactly you. what they want. Yeah, that's what they want, right? I mean, I've heard some, actually some bankers um, posit that it's actually not going to be, it's not going to be the banks, it's not going to be the financial system that's going to like, truly like drive decentralization of finance at scale. It's going to be the regulators themselves because they'll be like, you know, we don't want all these uh, centralized counterparties out there because we're so tired of like chasing you around and trying to regulate all the time. We want the decentralized ecosystem where you know, we have that transparency, right? And we, and we know that it's neutral. It's not going to be controlled by some single shady actor, right? And, and when there are these centralized points of failure, which does always have to exist in the end, right? When it comes to things like custody of, of commodities, right? Or something. Then um, when that's the case, the radical transparency just makes it so much easier to keep track of them, right? Which actually also like um, ties back to how Maker can, can approach this, right? Because um, a lot of people, they do get very, um, you know, I, I, I would even say scared, right? Of this idea that, well, DAI is, right now is this pure asset, right? It's backed by ETH, it's decentralized, you know, there's no governments that can seize it and so on, right? So once they start realizing that, okay, if we want to go to 100 billion, we can't rely on ETH alone anymore. So that means, that means centralized assets, that means centralization, that means now the government's going to take control, right? But the answer is, that um, the, we can use the fundamental principle of decentralization, even in this new paradigm of tokenized renewable assets in the form of diversification, right? So you don't want to put all, I mean, you never want to put all your eggs in one basket, right? So you never want to rely on just, you know, one custodian or even one legal system, right? Of course, yeah. You want to have real estate from every continent, right? You want to have trade finance assets from, uh, you know, as many different, um, jurisdictions that have a strong rule of law as possible in the whole world, right? You want to, we want to get Maker to a point where you could have, let's say, even the United States of America totally cracking down on it and saying, like, we're going to ban it, every, we're going to seize it all, we're going to ban it, you know? And if the, like, I mean, the, the ecosystem needs to be diversified enough and resilient enough that even if that happens, it'll keep going on. It'll, I mean, it'll be a big loss, right? But that's what MKI is for, right? That's, that's one of the fundamental dynamics of the system is that it needs to be able to absorb these kind of events and keep going and continue to provide stability to the people that need it in Argentina and, you know, Venezuela and so on, right? And, um, yeah, I mean, the path to, to that point is it's going to be a lot it's of work. It's going to be a lot of work, yeah. And, uh, and ultimately, of course, we don't ever want to see... America cracking down on crypto, right? And I don't think it's going to happen because, I mean, um, with the right approach, it's just not going to happen, right? With, if you do education first and sort of like step-by-step -step adoption, um, 
everyone realizes the benefits, right? And, and it really can be done in a way where it just is going to be better for everyone. Decentralized finance is, is massive in its application. And we see a lot of um, companies rebranding to talk more about DeFi now. But um, the, the, the DeFi players that have been around for a while... Um, they're incredibly powerful when you realize the technology of them. I mean, I've been watching Uniswap closely recently. Uniswap doesn't have a token um, at the moment. Maybe they will release one at some point in the future, but there's no Uniswap token. But um, Uniswap is very, very interesting because what you see happening with them is that they've their volume has absolutely exploded. I saw yesterday they're up to like uh, $45 million a day in volume or something like that, which for reference oh, wow. is like um, about one-eighth of uh, Coinbase. So you can understand how big their volume is becoming on a decentralized platform. We also see people doing initial liquidity offerings, which is kind of similar to a, an ICO offering where they'll be listing their tokens there and then investors can come in and play around and grab tokens and speculate and all that stuff. And this is all happening in a decentralized manner. You can also be a liquidity provider. So you can actually, if you have spare tokens sitting in your wallet, you can make money by being a market maker in a totally decentralized way. So what I see happening with these decentralized finance services is a complete reimagining of the way that we understand finance because what you have globally right now is a system where you have a lot of walled gardens, right? And if you live in a walled garden, that's a good one, a nice garden, right? Then you're lucky and you can have access to a rich, rich uh range of financial services. If you don't live in one of the nicer walled gardens, then you're basically screwed. Whereas with decentralized technologies, now we have the ability to offer anybody anywhere who has access to a smartphone a savings account, right? You can get a savings account and lend your uh, dollars out on compound finance or something like that and get a decent annual rate of return which is very, very powerful. You can also take a decentralized loan. So if you do have that collateral sitting there, then you can go and get a loan for that and do it all in a decentralized way. And those loan mechanisms with projects like Maker, which is definitely, you know, for all the hype that's going on around some of the, the players that have, um, you know, seen bigger gains and, you know, maybe newer to the scene, Maker, one of the older projects, they're still incredibly powerful. And they've started integrating real world assets so you can now take a freight invoice or you can take a music royalty futures and um, actually exchange that for cash on the Maker platform, which it's very, very powerful stuff. And this is just the early applications for this. So we're going to see this technology continue to develop and continue to really put pressure on the legacy financial system because I don't think they can compete. When you actually understand what this technology is delivering, why would you keep your money in a bank? when you can keep your money in your hands and you can get incredible rates of return in the crypto economy versus your bank account. I mean, you can use something like a more centralized service like BlockFi and you get like 8.6% of your dollars or you can use something like Compound Finance, which is more decentralized and you get great rates on your dollars over there as well. Or you can have it in like a Chase bank account and get 0.01%. It's just, <laughs> it's not even fair. It's it's laughable, exactly. It's not even fair how how much decentralized finance is going to disrupt multiple industries, multiple industries are going to be disrupted by this. And it's primarily going to be the financial industries to, at the start. We will see other use cases come in later on, but decentralized finance, it's it's big. It's um, if you have the money to be able to participate in um, yield farming or in liquidity making, then there's a lot of money to be made there too, especially early on. You know, a lot of these things that are going on, these platforms, if successful, people like Compound Finance and Ave, if they're successful, they're going to be here for a long time. They're going to be the big players in 10 years' time. And getting their tokens now, that could be very, very profitable in the long run. Yeah.